Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. We have started a new section. So we started a section on random number generation. So how do we generate the sequences? And I made a small introduction, yeah, discussing pseudo random number generators, yeah, the linear concurrential generators. Oh, we also saw the mass and twister. And we know how to generate uniform distributions on zero one so we can utilize this for the monte carlo integration and yeah the last slide on my previous section was actually that one where we sampled a two-dimensional random vector from a one-dimensional sequence and we made the observation that okay there are some regions where we have many points and some regions yeah, where we have, say, a few points. And we ask ourselves, okay, is this a, is this a good property yeah, that we have sometimes a cluster and sometimes such an uh, empty space? Well, in the section before that, when we discussed the Monte Carlo method, we actually saw that the randomness of the sequence uh, is a feature. So we had this little uh, yeah, intuitive explanation here uh, where we saw it is a feature that we add something new to every component. Yeah? So it is independent in every component. So we do not hit the same uh, point uh, again. Yeah? So that's actually a feature that breaks the curse of dimension. But now let maybe dimension, let but now let me put maybe dimension you know, a bit apart and just consider a one-dimensional, given one-dimensional sequence or given two-dimensional sequence and look again at the properties of this sequence. And this is the topic of today. It is the discrepancy. And having defined the discrepancy and the variation uh, of the function, we, uh, we find the nice coxma uh, lavka uh, inequality which is actually the thing that removes the probability from our uh, convergence rate. So we really get a point-wise uh, convergence result. So if you look again at our Monte Carlo sum, so our approximation of the integral, so this is take the sum i from one to n, f of xi divided by n, then Actually, it does not matter if the xi occur in a random order. Well, so, in fact, the xi, the sequence, uh, I mean, it could be sorted. And the Monte Carlo integral would still be the same. So is this kind of randomness really such a big uh, thing yeah, in, in this uh, method here? So to motivate the concept that we introduce now, the discrep discrepancy, uh, maybe we start with a small uh, coding experiment. We integrate uh, again our test function in the Monte Carlo integrator test. It was that we integrate the cosine using our Monte Carlo integration algorithm. So I'm indeed here using my Monte Carlo integration 1D algorithm. But now I take a different sequence. I take a non-random sequence, maybe just take i divided by m. Or alternatively, yeah, these are, if i starts in zero, these are always the left endpoints, yeah, often equipartitioning. Alternatively, you could also take the center point. Yeah? So i plus one half divided by n. Let's try our Monte Carlo integration with these sequences. I mean, they are not random and see what we get. So we had here our integrator experiment where we integrated the function cosine of x. So that was our integrand. We know the analytic solution is the sine of x. So we just called here our integrator, integrate this integrand from zero to five. Okay, analytic solution is the sine at five 
minus the sine at zero. And we could immediately calculate the error from that. And we did this for two integrators. Yeah? So we defined this interface integrator here. So the interface integrator just has this method integrate. And we used this little test for our Simpsons rule and for our Monte Carlo integrator. So the Monte Carlo integrator, if you now look into that one, was taking the number of evaluation points and then some guy, yeah, a double supplier that provides the sequence. So this double supplier is just an interface that has a method get as double. So it gives me the next double number and I can ask him and I get again and again a new double number, in our case, a uniform random number sequence. So I have these two inputs and what we do is we just take the next random number. If our domain goes from lower bound to upper bound, I transform the random number, which is between zero and one to the domain. So it's lower bound plus random number multiplied with domain size. And then I take uh, the value of the function. I sum all these guys up and I divide by the number of evaluation points. And if I have transformed the domain, I'd have to multiply with the domain size. So that was our uh, Monte Carlo integrator. Maybe I just run the test. You know that Monte Carlo integration has convergence rate one divided by square root of number of evaluation points, yeah, order of. And the Simpsons rule has one divided by number of evaluation points to the power of four. So if I take 100 points, actually I have to take 101 because Simpsons requires an odd number of evaluation points. This is a 10 to the power of two. So if I run that guy, I would expect a 10 to the power of eight. Yeah, actually minus eight, a one divided by 10 to the power of eight for the Simpsons, yeah, two times four. Okay, so we see the error is really small. So we get that. And for the Monte Carlo, it is a 10 to the minus one. Uh, okay, here's seven times 10 to the minus one. Uh, so it's a bit worse, but it's around that order. If we go from uh, 10 to the power of two to 10 to the power of four, I see indeed 10 to the minus 16, almost machine precision already for the Simpsons rule. And here I have indeed now a 10 to the minus two, yeah? So it is the square root of the uh, 10 to the power of four, yeah? one divided by the square root of the 10 to the power of four. Yeah, and if you go on, you see that this convergence rate really uh, fits here. Okay, so um, let's do this um, exercise. Let's input, it, uh, implement a Monte Carlo integration using not a random sequence. And because it is not a random sequence, I should use maybe uh, the word quasi Monte Carlo. Yeah? So it looks like Monte Carlo, but it isn't Monte Carlo. So I just copy maybe here this class and I just call it now quasi Monte Carlo integrator yeah? 1D. And this quasi Monte Carlo integrator is now my Monte Carlo integrator. But instead of, say, this uh, random number generator here, I just use this special structured sequence. So I remove the random number generator. I don't need that guy. And here, yeah, the random number, this is now, say, my uniform discretization point. Okay, so this is just I divided by N. Okay, so maybe that guy should be a floating point number. So, and then I just go on and I just do the same with this uniform discretization point, this guy between zero and one. Yeah, maybe I add this to my test. No, so you see, here is my test. I add this to my test. So I create here also just copy the code. But now this is the integrator, say, 
quasi Monte Carlo. And on the right hand side, I initialize my quasi Monte Carlo integrator 1D. He doesn't need this random number generator. And I use that one in my test. Yeah, let's keep fingers crossed and check what we have. Okay, so my quasi Monte Carlo generator, yeah, it actually uh, works. Yeah, maybe I make this here a little bit more pretty. So I will use So I add some padding, so it is aligned. Yeah, we see this quasi Monte Carlo integrator. It has a 10 to the minus four error. If I have 10 to the power of four evaluation points. Yeah. Okay, let's add two digits. Yeah, I have a 10 to the minus six error. If I have a 10 to the power of six evaluation points, this guy here has a 10 to the minus three yeah so this here looks really like one divided by square root of n this guy looks the, like one divided by n so it's much better yeah okay but yeah it is a non-random sequence but it's the same algorithm it's monte carlo integration yeah uh, maybe i also try the guy that is here yeah the one with the center points uh so maybe switch back to the 10 to the power of four. So I have a 10 to the minus four. It's a 1.79, 10 to the minus four. And now in my quasi Monte Carlo integrator, let's use actually here I plus 0.5, yeah? So I use these center points, I plus 0.5 divided by number of evaluation points. So just recall 1.79, 10 to the minus four. Well, I get a 10 to the minus eight suddenly. Okay, you see that you have a Monte Carlo algorithm and the distribution of the points, if it is evenly distributed, can make a large a large difference. Of course, you find this experiment in our repository if you like to play a little bit. Yeah, so it is in this package here. What what is this property that decides if a sequence is well? Yeah, a good sequence with respect to our. Monte Carlo integration or a bad sequence. So if you go back to this picture here, you see we have these empty spaces and we also have these clusters. So maybe we should analyze uh, how the distribution of the points is in the sense, is the distribution of the points evenly? So you could define just a rectangle And then decide uh, how many points are in this rectangle. So here there is zero. And how many points would you expect in this rectangle? Well, if this is the domain that we use in our definition of the Monte Carlo integration, so it goes from zero to one in both dimensions. Well, the area, the whole area of this domain is one. So. Actually, if you take the Lebesgue measure of such a rectangle, the Lebesgue measure should correspond to the percentage of points you expect in this area. So we can take maybe here A1, B1, A2, B2, and the number of points, the percentage of the points that we would expect in this rectangle is actually just B1 minus A1 multiplied with B2 minus A2. Yeah? So that's the Lebesgue measure of this rectangle. So we can maybe test with many such rectangles if there are much fewer points 
then the measure of the rectangle would suggest, or if there are maybe too many points, yeah, maybe you can also take this one, uh, a very small space, but you have two points, yeah, maybe you would just expect one point in this rectangle. So these are here uh, 100 points. So this is now the main idea when defining the discrepancy. So we just do what we did in the picture. The discrepancy of a sequence, so it's a function d of x1 to xn. So this is given by, okay, we take the sequence and we count the number of points that are in a given rectangle. So we have a vector A that defines the lower bound of the rectangle and um, a vector B that defines the upper bound, yeah, the lower left bound, the upper right bound, if you are in two dimension of the rectangle. And then we measure the number of points that are in this rectangle. We divide by the total number of points. So the percentage of points that are in this rectangle. And we compare this to the Lebesgue measure of this rectangle. Yeah, there could be too many. There could be too few. So we take, of course, then the absolute value of the dis difference of these two. And then we take the supremum over all those selections of a rectangle. So this here is my test rectangle. And the Lebesgue measure is just, of course, the volume calculated by multiplying the length of the edges. And this is just counting the number of points in this rectangle. This is one definition now of our concept, the discrepancy. There is an alternative definition of this concept. It is the star discrepancy. So for the star discrepancy, we just use rectangles that starts in zero. So it's actually the special case where A is equal to zero. Okay, so you just have that you take different rectangles with different points. And you can now show that these concepts are almost uh, equivalent. So of course, the star discrepancy is always uh, smaller or equal than the discrepancy, yeah, because the rectangles with A equals zero are contained in the above definition. But you can also prove that you have an upper bound so the discrepancy is also always less or equal to to the power of d, the dimension uh, of the star disc discrepancy. So if you have one dimension, yeah, so you have a factor of two, yeah, because actually you have to combine maybe two such rectangles to uh, create uh, the value of the other definition. Uh, and this two to the power of D is just a constant. I mean, we are actually interested in how does this behave as the sequence grows, yeah? as the sequence, what convergence rate do we get? So for the convergence rate, this constant doesn't matter. Yeah? I mean, it depends on the dimension, but it's a constant. It does not uh, grow uh, with respect to the size of the sequence. And for that reason, and because the star discrepancy is a little bit easier, um, we will focus on the star. Yeah, there is an elementary method for calculating this. Yeah, so the problem in the definition is that you have to take the supremum over all such possible rectangles, so we have to test here infinitely many rectangles. And indeed, you can show that you just have to test a finite number of such rectangles. So there is an elementary method for the exact 
calculation, yeah, where we just have a finite number of such rectangles. And this method works like that. So we have our sequence, so our sequence x1, 2, xn. And from that sequence, I now define the sets of points yeah, or uh, elements where the set gamma j, so now the set gamma j, is defined by taking the component, the j components out of this sequence. Yeah. So if you have a sequence of a two-dimensional vector running, gamma one is the, the points that you observe in the first component, and the gamma two yeah, is just the second component two of your, your sequence. Um, and you add also, in addition, the point one to that. If you like to depict this, for example, if you have three sample points, then the set gamma consists of taking this component, this component, this component, and so on. Okay, so this is the set gamma one, and the set gamma two is take this component, this component, this component, and also take the one. So this is the set gamma two. And then you build the Cartesian product of these gammas. So you take all points that now lie on the intersection of these lines. Yeah. Okay, so my Cartesian product, my set gamma x, are now all those points that lie on the intersection of components of different different points. Yeah. So this point here comes from taking the first component of that point and the second component of that point. And these are now the rectangles that you have to test. Yeah. So I have to test, for example, this rectangle here, or I have to test this rectangle here, or that rectangle. Well, not precise. I have to test two rectangles. So there are two rectangles because I test this rectangle excluding and including this point. So I now take points out of this set gamma, and then I take the open interval. So these are so this is, for example, something like that. The open interval from zero to x, that's a rectangle because x is a vector. Yeah, The open interval from zero to x, and I test the closed interval from zero to x. That's this rectangle. Yeah, and for that, I do the intersection with my set. So this means I just count how many evaluation points are now in this. Yeah, so recall evaluation points is just the green points. Yeah, I count how many evaluation points, how many points from my original sequence do I have in this uh, set. And I take the percentage value, so I divide by n, and compare it to the uh, Lebesgue measure. So, and from that, I take the maximum value. So maybe to get an intuition for this discrepancy, uh, let me focus a little bit here on this function that we have, the difference of the Lebesgue measure and the number of points that we count in the set. So let me go to the one dimensional example. So this here is the example where we have three sample points in two dimensions. And it was just to illustrate how these sets are constructed. Let me go to a one dimensional example. So now I have just the interval from zero to one in one dimension. And I have now say five 
sample points. I have these five sample points where that uh, is looking random. And let us just consider the one side of this function. Yeah. So what is that function? The other function, yeah, because it's closed interval, yeah, is very similar. So what is happening here? Uh, well, the Lebesgue measure of the interval from zero to x. Yeah, this is just x minus zero, this is just x. So this is a linear function, yeah? So this function goes up like that. Okay, so then you look how many points do you count in this interval up to x. So in this interval up to x, so for example, here, yeah, there are no points. So the first change is when you hit this point. Then you see, okay, there is a one, a one divided by n. So how many points do I have? I have a five, one divided by five is an 0 0.2. So you subtract an 0 0.2. Your function has reached 0 0.1. I will subtract an 0 0.2, so we will jump down. So we will jump down and we end up here. And now the Lebesgue measure continues to be a linear function. So it will go like that again. And we count another point. So now I have a two divided by five. Yeah. So that's like a four divided by 10. Yeah. It's an 0 0.4. So this here is an 0 0.3. This here is an 0 0.4. So I jump down again to the minus 0.1. Yeah, and now that goes on, yeah? So my discrepancy is now growing. And now he is suddenly realizing that, okay, there's a large space where we have no point. So now he is suddenly realizing that we move a little bit uh, higher until we reach the other point at 0.7, where we again jump down yeah, by a one divided by five, yeah, because we have another additional one divided by five. So all these jumps here, all these jumps here are actually, we get one more point out of our five points. So all these jumps are one divided by five. And the slope here is one, yeah, because our Lebesgue measure has uh, slope one. And you see that now, if you'd like to take the maximum of this fun function, uh, actually the other guy is flipping the sign and it's also taking the um, uh, intervals then where this point is not belonging to the function, this point is belonging to the function. Okay, that's because it is here open uh, or closed, yeah. Uh, but you understood the concept. Yeah, so now we take the maximum of this function and you see our discrepancy is just the 0 0.3, the point that we reach here. The discrepancy is the 0 0.3. And this, it's the star one because we always started in zero with our consideration. Of course, the discrepancy is attained in this region because there is this large empty space here and it would be maybe better to move this point a little bit to the left or maybe take that point and move it a bit here. Yeah, so that would be a bit better. I have a small uh, code experiment that creates actually this function and that calculates the discrepancy now for some sample points. Yeah, I do not want to develop this code live, so I just stepped through the code and maybe you can play a little bit with this code. It it's also not so interesting how I calculate this. It's maybe more interesting what we see as what we see as results. So here is in this package random number experiments, there will be a references, a reference to this class in the script. Here in this package you find the discrepancy experiment. And here below 
I have actually a function that calculates these two values. Yeah. So what is the Lebesgue measure? The Lebesgue measure is just the X. And how many points do we count in this interval? Uh, it, it does this for the two parts, yeah, uh, the open and closed interval. Yeah? And um, then takes the maximum over all those, those guy, guys. So that's actually our methods to calculate the discrepancy of a given sequence. Yeah? So I'm sorting this sequence and then I'm going from left to right and I calculate this. And I also do here a plot, yeah? exactly a plot um, a, of the function that I discussed. Yeah? So the function that is x, our Lebesgue measure, minus count the number of points for which in the samples, the sample is smaller than x. Uh, divided by the number of samples. So I just plot this uh, function. Okay, so this is um, happening here. And um, maybe I exclude a few parts here, which will come a bit later. And just have these plots here. And this here is just a random sequence, yeah? And you see that there are actually uh, two effects. So if you have too many points, you get too many jumps down. And this could be a candidate here for our D star discrepancy uh, with a minus. And if you have too many empty spaces, you have a too long time with a larger slope. So that means if you say, for example, uh, have a distribution like that, where you have many points here in this region and, and then fewer points in that region, that's maybe not so good because you get at first too many jumps down. Of course, all the stuff is in the end compensating and you end up at the same region. So remind that and you have some intuition now for the discrepancy. So now we have to find um, a property of the sequence, the discrepancy. And it appears as if it is a good idea to have a sequence that has a low discrepancy. But I need a second ingredient. And this second ingredient, if, if you go back to our Monte Carlo error estimate, yeah, you see that we had also here two ingredients. There is one part that is coming here from the sequence. It's the one divided by n to the power of one half, yeah? our con which creates our convergence rate. So um, we saw that for this equidistributed sequence, we get maybe a one divided by n. Yeah? And there is another part in the estimate, which is a property coming from the function. It is here the sigma, where sigma squared is actually the variance of f of x, yeah, x being uniform. And recall that we had a similar estimate for the Simpsons rule. So you maybe remember that slide. So for the Simpsons rule, you also had a constant here, which was, say, related to the variability of the function. Yeah? So for the Monte Carlo, yeah, the constant was related to the variance here. For the Simpsons, it was related to the force derivative of the function, yeah, absolute value, which also encodes somehow the variability of the function. And this guy here is coming from how the points were placed, yeah, random or uh, structured. So my next ingredient is now to have a property that characterizes the variability of the function. And maybe you know that for a one-dimensional function, there is the nice concept of the variation. So if I just consider my interval from zero to one, it is differentiate the function and if the function is oscillating, take the absolute value of these uh, changes. Yeah? So integrate 
df by dx absolute value. I need to generalize this to say higher dimensions. And this is now the variation in the sense of Hardy and Krause. And this looks a bit ugly here. Yeah. So we define now the variation of f um, by this sum over these v superscript k here. Yeah. Uh, but what is happening here? So you see, I define here some kind of partial functions. So this f restricted to i1 to ik is just a function that depends if you are in a d-dimensional cube here, that depends on the d vector, but only on the components xi1 to xik. So it only depends on the component xi1 to xik. So the function takes these components and sets all the other components to zero. Yeah? So I take this d vector and all the other components are set to zero and that's the vector that I'm now um, evaluating if I restrict this function to these components. So then you determine the variation of these functions. For example, if you just restrict to one uh, component, yeah, say just the ij, yeah, the f restricted to ij, then you determine you have a one-dimensional function, a function of one argument, then you determine the variation of this function in this direction you have restricted to. So you take the derivative of that function with respect to the components you have restricted and you integrate along these components. You do this for all possible combinations of restricting components. I do that now for all possible combinations of restricting components, and I take then the sum over all those combinations. Yeah, now there is a small puzzling thing. Uh, the restriction is not only to a single component. Sometimes I also restrict to two, three, four components if I have a higher dimensional object. And then you take here the case derivative. So uh, this looks a little bit like you are now using a second derivative, but this is not completely true because note that this is a case derivative in the sense that every component is only differentiated once. Yeah, So it's a little bit like what is the change in the x1 direction and then how does that change in the x2 direction? Yeah, It is not the second derivative in uh, the direction x1. So maybe a small note here. So each coordinate gets differentiated uh, only once. So this is a little bit like going yeah, in alternating uh, directions. So this is a concept now for the variation. Uh, in yeah, generalized to higher dimensions, which I will need. Uh, maybe the more interesting thing is the other concept, our discrepancy, which characterizes uh, the sequence. And now I can combine these two things to the following yeah, surprising inequality. So I have the Coxma Lafka inequality, this tells me I have now given a sequence x1 to xn in d dimensions and the difference of my Monte Carlo integral and the true integral over the unit hypercube is bounded by the variation of the function 
multiplied with the discrepancy of the sequence. And surprise, there's no more probability involved. Yeah? So this is not a probabilistic result. This is like in our classical integration rule. So it is the discrepancy of the sequence and placing the point random yeah, will maybe create in a probabilistic sense a discrepancy which is one divided by square root of n. But now we have understood this discrepancy and there is the question, can we generate sequences that have low or even lower discrepancy as one divided by square root of n? And that's indeed uh, possible. So you may think, okay, what's the point here? Yeah, We could just use the sequence from the Simpsons rule uh, but we will later come to this. I would like to have a sequence that can continue to grow and achieve low discrepancy while it is growing. Before I come to this, a small remark, this bound is sharp. Yeah? So this bound is sharp in the sense that for any given sequence x1 to xn, yeah, I can find a special function f such that yeah the bound yeah is sharp in the sense such that the error is larger than the discrepancy minus n epsilon yeah so there exists uh, an epsilon larger uh, than zero such that my bound is larger than the discrepancy my error is larger than the discrepancy minus um, epsilon for uh, a function yeah, where the function has variation variation one. Yeah? Maybe we prove uh, this uh, result here in one dimension. Yeah? So I show you that you can now choose for any given sequence, you can choose a function yeah, such that you cannot become better. This is also maybe a nice exercise because that was when we discussed the intuition of the Monte Carlo method. Um, when you have a structured grid, you can always think of a function that is yeah, not very suitable for this grid that has a an high, an high uh, error. Yeah? So let's go back maybe to our example with these five sample points in one dimension and illustrate uh, the result that the bound is sharp with this. And it's also yeah, a proof. Yeah. Maybe you can work that a little bit out. So um, I consider the one dimensional case, D is equal to one. And I assume that my sequence is ordered because the discrepancy does not depend here on the ordering. So my sequence is an ordered sequence. And I assume that the discrepancy is attained in the point XK in this left expression of our equation six. Equation six was the one that is defining the discrepancy. So that one here. Yeah, and I make the simplifying assumption that in six, I attain the discrepancy in this expression here. So I take the maximum over all those guys and it is this guy that is creating the discrepancy like it was in our example, yeah, so where it is this point here for this sample point in this function that defines the discrepancy. So attaining the discrepancy in XK would be here in our example, this point, though this point is our XK and this here is the D star. Okay, then you have a very large region here where you have too few points. Yeah, So it comes here from this area where I have too few points. So let's take a function 
that is one in this region and zero otherwise. Yeah, And then I have too few points and then I should be maybe a bit off from the integral. So now I take a function f larger than zero. The function is one and it's one up to xk minus epsilon. So this function looks like that. So uh, it has to be a smooth function. So the function is one, and then I use the epsilon yeah, uh, space to go smoothly to down, down to zero. So if you have this function, yeah, you know the integral of this function is this area here. And this area is clearly larger than the rectangle if you just go to xk minus epsilon. Yeah? So just recall, this here was my xk. So the integral I'm approximating is larger or equal xk minus epsilon. So now what is the Monte Carlo integral doing? Yeah? I'm subtracting from my integral the Monte Carlo integral, the function is one yeah, on this set. So the Monte Carlo integral is just counting how many points are on this set divided by the number of points. So I just count this guy and this guy divided by n. So the Monte Carlo integral is a k minus one divided by n. So this is now my error. So I have xk minus epsilon minus k minus one divided by n. And now you see that xk minus k minus one divided by n is exactly the discrepancy expression because the discrepancy is doing exactly the same. It's taking here the open interval counting how many points are in this open interval, the two divided by n, so that's the part from the Monte Carlo integral, and take the difference to the Lebesgue measure, which is the integral of the function f. So these two guys here, xk and k minus one divided by n, are just the discrepancy of the sequence. And I have this minus, minus epsilon. So you see that the error of the two integral minus the Monte Carlo integral is indeed larger or equal the star discrepancy minus epsilon. So you find a, yeah, a function that explores yeah, the gaps in this sampling of the segments. So now we have a very nice um, error bound and we have a reasonable approximation of the function f yeah? uh, if the sequence has low discrepancy. So you might think back of my motivation in the beginning where I just started by taking an equi partitioning of the interval or even I considered The even better sequence, yeah, take just the center points. So this guy had a very small error. And clearly now you understand, okay, this has a very small discrepancy because in every interval, yeah, you find approximately very well the percentage of points that correspond to the size of the interval. Yeah, they are evenly distributed, no clusters, no gaps. Yeah, maybe we should use just that. Okay, but this sequence has a disadvantage. Yeah? So this sequence has a disadvantage because you need to generate the sequence again and again if you increase the number of points. Yeah. So if you have three points, yeah, maybe like that, 
if you have four points, maybe like that. Well, okay, so you see this uh, are completely, these are completely your points. Yeah? So this is not what I like because the Monte Carlo method had this nice feature that you can just increase the accuracy by taking more and more points. So the question is now, can we find an infinite sequence? such that every subset x1 to xn has low discrepancy. We, because then we have a quasi-Monte Carlo method. Yeah? We have a sequence that runs on and on, and we have a convergence result from the coxma lavka inequality. We can add additional points, improve the accuracy. So this is the next thing we like to consider low discrepancy sequences. And these sequences are then called quasi random number sequences. Yeah. So it's no longer a random, but we have this feature that they fill the space evenly yeah, if we use more and more points. So let's have a look at low discrepancy sequences in one dimension. So if you consider the one dimensional case, yeah, obviously the sequence one divided by n has discrepancy, just one divided by n, but it has the disadvantage if you increase the number n, then you have to recreate the whole sequence. So the idea of low discrepancy sequences is to find an infinite sequence such that every subsequence has low discrepancy. Yeah, okay, before I define uh, a sequence that has this property, maybe we do a small experiment and you just ask yourself if you have the interval from zero to one, where would you place the points? Okay, so maybe I make this a bit nicer. Where would you now place the points? Okay, so maybe you can think for yourself the first point, ah, that's a huge empty space. Maybe the first point can go in the middle. Okay, so where do we place the second point? Yeah, I see uh, again a huge empty space, but now I see two. Yeah, so maybe I place the next point here. Um, now, where do we place the third point? Okay, that's maybe obvious. Uh, okay, maybe I place the point here. But now where do you place the next point? Uh, so you have one, two, three, four intervals here. Maybe uh, I choose this guy here. This guy here. And now where would you place the next one? Well, you could say, hmm, I place it here. But then you have so many points here yeah, and so few points at the other end, or you place it here, but then you have so many points here and so many points on the other. Maybe we place it here. Yeah, Looks a little bit better, right? Okay, so maybe we place it there. So you see that the way of constructing the points when you like to fill it evenly is maybe not so obvious. So if you consider the problem again, and you would say, okay, take the center point, which is cutting in one half. And then when you like to cut in one over four, you just go from left to right and do it. Yeah? So it's one over four, one over four. And then if you like to cut into one over eight, 
as interval size. You just go from left to right and do it. Yeah? But if you do that now here from left to right, you see that it leads to the fact that you have a region where you are already very refined and you have another region where you are not so refined. Yeah? So going here from left to right is maybe not a good thing. So we have to think a little bit better, yeah. And this indeed would make the discrepancy uh, smaller. So you can maybe calculate the discrepancy for this guy here and this guy. And I also have it in the code. So I have this small discrepancy experiment here. And if you now look to this experiment, which plots this function, you see there are here below two plots for the discrepancy where I go from left to right and I do the refinement one over eight, two over eight, three over eight from left to right. But then I still have the missing parts two over four, three over four from the previous one. And there's the other one where I place actually the one over eight there. And then I use the five over eight as the refinement. Yeah? So these are exactly these uh, two pictures. Yeah, The one over eight here, the five over eight here, yeah? or the one over eight and three over eight. If you now look at the plots of the two discrepancy, you see that they look like that. And if you go from left to right, yeah, you have too many points on the left side. So you have many of these jumps down. Yeah? And you see we deviate from the zero. And then we have too few points. So we are pulled back up. Yeah? While the other one, there's this point missing here. So since this point here is missing, we are get pulled up a little bit more back to the zero, and then we jump down. And that's actually helpful. So placing these points, not always for in, in the structured way, even improve the discrepancy. So not refine stupidly from left to right. So I would like to use the upper idea. And this is like the van der Korput sequence does it. So this is here the definition of the van der Korput sequence, a low discrepancy sequence in one dimension. Yeah, definition looks a little bit complicated. So the van der Korput sequence is a sequence in my interval from zero to one. And it's defined as follows. So there is a parameter, the base, the base B, which is a natural number. So I need the base later, but for example, in the previous example, I used base two. Yeah, I was always using one half and then one over four, which is two to the power of two, then one over eight, which is two to the power of three. So you see, you have different refinement levels and these refinement levels are one divided by B to the power of some J. So it is a B to the minus J. And then you sum up these yeah, refinement levels. So I take the sum of one divided by B to the power of J, the sum J from one to infinity with a coefficient alpha I J to construct the i's element of the sequence. For example, my first element was one half. Then you would take alpha one, it's the first element of the sequence, j to be one, yeah, because it is one half, zero, 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 zero. Because you just add a single one half. The next one would be 
Zero One, Zero Zero Zero. A zero one, zero 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 is at one over four. And the next one is then one one, zero zero zero, which is one half plus one over four. Okay. Um, so one half plus one over four, yeah, you three over four. So that was the way how we created this. Okay, so how are these coefficients here? Yeah, uh, these coefficients, you maybe already guessed it. The first coefficient was the sequence 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, just take the first entry. The second one was 0, 1. The next one was 1, 1. So what's the next one? It is 0, 0, 1, which corresponds to take 1 of the 1 over 8. So these look like binary numbers. Okay, indeed, the uh, coefficients alpha i j are now defined such that they represent the binary if b is base two, if b is two, yeah, binary representation of the index. Yeah? So. For example, i equals 1, my alpha 1 j is 1, 0, 0, 0. Huh? i equals 2, my alpha 2 j is 0, 1, 0, 0. i equals 3 my alpha 3j is 1, 1, 0, 0. And you also see that from that here, alpha ij is 0 if j is large enough. Which means that actually this here is a finite sum. Yeah, here the blue part is the example if base is two, yeah. So if base is something else, of course the alpha ij's are the corresponding coefficients in this base b representation. So the alpha ij comes from zero to b minus one. So this is the definition of this sequence. Yeah, maybe here for illustration, what do we have? On the left side, you calculate your alpha ij. Yeah, you calculate your alpha ij from the given index. Yeah, so here you have the index. So if it is one, it is one times one. If it is two, it is one times two plus zero times one. If it is three, it is one times two plus one times one. And then you use these in the construction of the sequence where you have here the, the refinement factor with your base. Yeah? So one divided by two to the power of j. Okay, there's a minus, that's actually double, yeah. So this should be a plus, small typo here. Two to the power of j. And then you use the coefficients that you have from the representation of the index in the construction of the sequence. So these guys here are again your alpha ij. And this guy here, or maybe start with this one. This guy here, yeah, which is the digit at how many units of one do we have is actually do we have an one half or don't we have an one half yeah so this bit here decides if we add an one half and this bit here decides if we add a one over four yeah? so this guy is deciding if we add a one over four 
two, the one over two, or not. Yeah? So then we have completed the uh, refinement. Yeah. So we have now the three points. Yeah. So we have four intervals, three points, four intervals. Each interval is one over four. We have completed this refinement. So we start with one over eight. So for the one over eight, again, I represent my indices with these alphas here. So I get an additional bit. The additional bit in the index is deciding that we now have a level of four. Yeah, so we go from four, five, six, seven, and all the other guys are the same. So we have the two that we add or that we don't add, and we have the one that we don't add or we add. Yeah, and Actually, you see that this part here just repeats what we did here, but always adding to all points an additional one over eight. Yeah. So you have this refinement to one over eight is the first point is placed at one over eight. And then you just add to all previous refinement things everything is shifted by by one over eight. Yeah, okay, so that's the van der Korpus sequence here in the script. Yeah, you also find again what I did in the motivation. So the first point is placed at one half, and then you move to the next level. The next level is one over four. Yeah? So it means that I add a one over four to the zero, and I add a one over four to the one half. And then the next refinement level is the one over eight. So I add a one over eight to the zero. And then I add a one over eight to the one half. Then to the one over four guys. So I add a one over four. And the one over eight, that is the three over eight and the seven over eight. Okay, and you know that now the van der Korput sequence, this populating in this way is better for, with respect to the discrepancy than populating everything from uh, left to right. So the first seven elements of the van der Korput sequence with base two, yeah, we just constructed it, one half, one over four, three over four, one over eight, and so on. And if you, for example, move to base 10, yeah, the first 21 elements are just, okay, first the whole level, yeah, one divided by 10, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, uh, and so on. Yeah, And then the refinement is adding a 0 0.01 to all those guys. Yeah, So it's going to 0 0.01, 0 0.11, and so on. And now you can prove that the stark discrepancy of this sequence is log of n divided by n. So this sequence has almost order one divided by n, yeah, which is the discrepancy of i divided by n. Yeah. But it is an infinite sequence that is refining, yeah, always refining the um, sampling. And I do not need to reconstruct the sequence if the n changes. Yeah? So I have it is, an, in addition, it is an infinite sequence. So we can improve the accuracy. So now in the script, I have some more coding session. You can peek into it if you like, but let's do that uh, next time. That was it for today. Thanks.